This is a narration of my D&D book, Forestera's Fate, Book One, The Sacred Shrine and the Valley of Caves. Preface. The first time I played Dungeons and Dragons was 1980, freshman year in college, at a school called Luther College in Decorah, Iowa. I knew nothing about the game other than what a few people had told me about it, so I really didn't know what to expect. There were around six of us. We all rolled up a character, and then we just went adventuring. One guy was the game caller, who would speak on behalf of the group. He would convey to the dungeon master, the guy who was running the game, what actions we would take as a group. We explored the land and ran into people and monsters on the road or in the wilderness. We found caves and explored them and found treasures copper, silver, and gold coins, gems, jewelry, and other items like armor and weapons, and some of them were magical. We found a magic ring, a magic scroll, and more. The game was basically exploring, interacting with people in towns, fighting monsters, finding treasures, all the while trying not to get killed. We didn't stop playing until 3 a.m., and I went to bed that night with my dreams filled with magic, monsters, and treasures. I couldn't wait to play again. It was unlike any other game I had ever played, and the most amazing thing was that I knew none of the rules. The entire game took place in my imagination. A lot of people associate the game of D&D with rules. Today there are over five editions of D&D, and each of them is still played by some. Some players believe that different editions of the game are different games. I once saw a comment that said that basic D&D is a completely different game from AD&D, Advanced Dungeons & Dragons. I was going to reply, but chose not to, because it's just not worth arguing with people. But what some players don't seem to understand is that it's all D&D. Every edition of D&D is just D&D with a different set of house rules. Another player commented that what I was doing in my game was a rules violation, I knew then that I was dealing with what we call a rules lawyer. I was going to say that in D&D there's no such thing as a rules violation, but then it would have just evolved from there. So instead, I said nothing. But D&D isn't about rules. It's about going adventuring. The rules that are used can vary in many ways, but the rules are just guidelines for playing the game. The game is what matters, and that game is going adventuring. Use whatever rules you want. When I wrote this story, I tried my best to convey what D&D is to me. I wanted to capture that magic that I experienced the first time I played, knowing none of the rules. I wanted to show that all D&D is, regardless of what rules you use, is going adventuring. So that's what this story is about. When I wrote it, it took me on an adventure. At times, the story seemed to take on a life of its own, and I ended up going down paths I hadn't even thought about at first. Ideas would just pop into my mind, so I followed them. The adventure ended up going differently than, I, than how I thought it would go, which very much surprised me, but I found myself loving where the, st- the story went. I, I know that sounds odd since I wrote it, but that's how it ended up feeling not even halfway into the story, and I was surprised at how long the story ended up being. I wasn't expecting that either. So I hope that reading it takes you on an adventure, and you enjoy reading it as much as I enjoyed writing it. Hopefully I'll write book two and more. I can only imagine where those adventures will lead, though I have a few ideas. Synopsis and Introduction The world you are about to enter is called Forestera. It is a world of my own creation where magic and monsters are real and good and evil are in a constant struggle for survival. Because of this, some people dare to go adventuring, to fight back against the evil that dwells in the land and to slay those monsters while finding treasures and acquiring power as they go. But when eight people formed their own adventuring party to do just that, little did they know what fate had in store for them. 
Just for clarity, the standard currency in Forastera from lowest to highest value is copper, silver, gold, and platinum coins. While most fantasy worlds use a gold standard, Forastera uses a silver standard because it makes copper usable while making gold and platinum quite valuable, let alone silver. It is said that only the brave and the foolish go adventuring, while the rest stay safe in their homes and villages, working the land or in their shops, earning their keep day to day, safe from the monsters that dwell in caves. To go adventuring is to literally put your life at risk, a price that most feel isn't worth it, but some just can't sit still in their homes. They suffer from wanderlust. Adventure is in their veins. So they go forth and risk it all for fame and or fortune, come what may. Chapter 1. The Gathering Somewhere in the wilderness, all of a sudden, an arrow landed about ten feet in front of them. The party stopped immediately, fear and shock on their faces. Immediately, two more arrows hit the ground next, next to the first. I see a few of them now in the trees. Only because we let you, elf. He was surprised she heard him, but he had yet to locate her, which concerned him. May we speak to you? We just want to meet you and talk to you. We do not want to talk to you. You are trespassing on our land. Now turn around and get out of our forest and leave us alone. Around nine months ago, as the third caravan came down the road that day, they were attacked by a large gang of bandits. The four guards who were traveling with them, along with several others, attacked back, but their leader was just too powerful. Surrendering, the bandits took their coins and many of their items and then went east into the woods and disappeared from their sight. Devastated and depleted of most of their supplies, the caravan continued down the road, glad to still be alive. A couple days later, another caravan was attacked, but this time it was a large group of goblins. They fought back, but there were just too many goblins. Fortunately, several fled south down the road. Luckily for them, the goblins didn't pursue, and they escaped with their lives. A few days later, a large group of 12 orcs attacked another caravan as it came around the bend from the west. A large battle ensued, but fortunately this caravan had six armed guards along with many others who fought back. They were eventually able to send the orcs fleeing north into the woods, but two guards and several others had fallen in battle along with seven orcs. Luckily, a cleric was, in, was with the caravan, and several helped bind the wounds of the fallen, while the cleric used his healing proficiencies in magic. Only orcs died that day. Those who were unconscious or couldn't walk due to their wounds and injuries were laid in the wagon, and the caravan continued down the road. About one to two months later, a large caravan came down the south road, because of how dangerous this road had become, two rich merchants teamed up to travel together. With them were 19 people and 12 heavily armored guards wearing splint mail and holding large shields and wielding broadswords. The bandit gang, though, had grown to over 20 men now. They all stood on a hill to the south and attacked the caravan as it came down the road. Panic and fear filled everyone's mind, but the guards engaged them in battle, refusing to surrender. The bandit leader killed one of the guards as two of his men fell, along with another guard. But right at that moment, over a dozen huge monsters came out of the woods to the northwest and attacked both groups. Both caravans started to flee, but the guards and the bandits continued to attack, but now they joined forces and took on the hideous beasts. The bandit leader engaged one by himself and eventually killed it, but he was now badly wounded, and now seven of his men had fallen, along with four guards, but only two of the giant monsters had fallen. 
The guards and bandits, now fearing for their lives, all turned in different directions and tried to flee. But the giant creatures captured several of them and took them all, both the dead and the living, to their lair. News of the great battle spread fast. Some said the bandit leader was killed. Others said he was captured, but a few said they saw him escape. With the bandit leader assumed to be out of the picture now, many were hopeful that things would go back to normal. But things didn't quiet down. The attacks continued fairly regularly as creatures continued to attack traveling caravans that came down the road. Around six months ago, caravans started bringing bulletins with them and posted them in every tavern in every village that was, ri- that was within several days of where the attacks were occurring, calling for a brave party of adventurers to come and put an end to this dire threat. Over the next couple of months, many adventurers traveled there to seek out the evil that threatened the land, but all of them failed to bring the attacks to an end. Some were never heard from again, while a few escaped and told tales of the hideous monsters they had encountered. Rumors started to spread, and soon they varied so much and the tales seemed so great that most were dismissed as typical exaggerations. A couple of adventurers who had escaped with their lives spoke of giants and even dragons. It seemed there was no end to the rumors that would continue to spread over time. Panic had set in. The people now feared for their lives. Something had to be done, but they were all too afraid to venture forth on their own. Instead, they all kept hoping that some group would succeed where the others had failed. But as the days went by, Their hope was slowly turning to despair. Around three months ago, Clavdrea stood at the crossroads, a scroll in her hand. It was the middle of the night. With her stood nine others, four women and four men, along with their leader, who was a beautiful and powerful looking woman. Clavdrea, the eight of you, Form a circle around us and begin the incantation on my order. You stand next to me. Now we will make certain that any other adventurers who travel here will either head down the road in haste or attack and kill each other. In time, chaos will reign, and when it does, you and I shall rule. I will not come here again, though, until that happens, as I have my own affairs that I must attend to daily. I only came this one time because you asked for my help. But after this, you are on your own. But now I doubt you'll have any more problems with adventurers. So relax and enjoy yourselves, all of you. Let's begin. About three weeks ago, Shayla. Hello, my good friend. How's everything going? Any change? Woman, why, hello, Shayla. I'm so happy to talk to you again, but things are not going well. The attacks continue. I thought that last party that came had a chance, but when they came to the crossroads, they started quarreling with themselves, and everything just fell apart from there. So how's your latest interest doing? Do you think they'll all get together and go adventuring? Shayla, I'm so happy to talk to you again, too. Here's hoping we can get together again soon. It's been quite a while since we last spent some time together. They are all doing well, and yes, I believe they will soon all get together, now that they've all gotten to know each other and have become good friends. I have great hope for all of them, she said, smiling. Woman, well, good. Here's hoping that they're as resourceful and as ethical as you believe they are. I look forward to hanging out with you again sometime. But for now, duty calls. Take care, my friend. Shayla, you too, dear. Take care. Shayla ended the communication and went back and sat down on her beautiful couch, turned on her vision screen, and continued her observations. Present day. It's the first day of the new year, 997, and the eight adventurers are seated around a large round table in the tavern at the inn of the Green Dragon in the village of Duran. 
they had all finally formed their own adventuring party and decided to meet here this evening for dinner and to discuss plans of where they thought they should go adventuring first. So many options, but they had been talking about this for several days now. The party of adventurers, Latia, half-elven, ranger druid, Lightmane, elven, warrior wizard, Nightwind, dwarven, warrior, Teneth, human cleric, Shinfia, human monk, Jack, human wizard, Phileas, gnome, illusionist rogue, Belfin, halfling rogue, Latia, I just want you all to know that I don't just consider all of you my friends, but also my family. For other than my elven father and his family members, you are all that I have now. I miss my mother very much, which is why I'm so glad I met all of you here in this beautiful village. Duran is a lovely place, but it's time to go adventuring. And I don't know about all of you, but I can't wait for tomorrow. Everyone, hear, hear, Lightmane. Well said, Latia, and here is to your mother, Shanae. She is with the gods in the world above, and I know you will see her again. Now she watches over you and all of us, for truly there can be no doubt that fate has brought us all together with our common stories and travels that brought us all here. I too greatly value my friendship with all of you and am eager to be about this business of adventuring and to leave this life of working to survive behind all of us. Tenneth. Then let us now determine, finally, where we shall venture forth first. There's the sacred shrine that's several miles to the southeast, the goblins who live somewhere in this forest, the moat house that's a little over a day's travel to the west, the keep that's a little over two days travel to the north, or the town of Lorendor that's around four days travel to the southeast. Where should we go first? I think we should start by staying close and seek out this shrine while also looking for goblins. That seems to me to be the best place to start. Nightwind, agreed. Though I say, let's just hunt the goblins and kill them first, and then we can go look for the shrine. I don't care if it angers the wood elves. Latia, but Nightwind, it's their forest, and apparently they don't want anyone walking around in their forest. So maybe we should just go find the moat house that's lying in ruins and see what's there, and then move on to the keep. Goblins are there too, according to the posted bulletin here. They're attacking travelers on the road. They're asking for adventurers to come there and help them. But I'm willing to go look for the shrine first, since it's close by, if that's what you all prefer. And if we run into goblins, then we'll fight. Lightmane. And if we run into wood elves, Latia, then we'll tell them what we're doing. Lightmane. And if they tell us to go back to Duran, Latia, we'll ask why. Why can't we go see your sacred shrine? We don't actually know that they don't want anyone walking through their forest. That's just what people are saying. Lightmane. Pretty much everyone is saying it, though, so I doubt it's not the case. Latia. Then we try to reason with them and see what happens. Besides, I want to talk to a wood elf, don't you? I want to know the truth instead of all this hearsay. Why can't we be friends? They hate goblins, we hate goblins. So goblins are our common enemy. So let's join forces. Why not? Light, Lightmane, you know why not. Latia, no, not really. Yes, supposedly wood elves are isolationists. Got it. But are they really? I'm serious. Do we know for certain that they are? Belfin, none of us have ever met one, so yeah, I'm pretty sure they're isolationists. Jack, and they might be dangerous too. Latia, Okay, so what? So they might be dangerous, so we better stay away? Well, why go adventuring then? It's dangerous to go adventuring, yet all of you want to leave the safety of Duran and go adventuring. Lightman, the danger of going adventuring is one thing. Goblins are evil. They are our common enemy. Wood elves aren't evil or our enemy. They just keep to themselves and want all of us to not bother them. So why risk angering those who are allies of Lord Doradin? I'm not opposed to any of our options, though. I believe as long as we are polite to them and show respect, that we'll have nothing to fear. If they demand that we exit their forest, then I think we all need to agree that that's what we'll do. I don't want to run into wood elves with all of us having different ideas of how we'll deal with them. 
We need to respect their wishes. They built their shrine to Doradin and his party, not us. Yes, others have traveled there and claimed various things about it, so sure, let's go seek it out ourselves and see what happens. But let's be united in how we treat the Wood Elves, if, if we run into them. I think we're all in agreement about what we'll do if we run into goblins. Phileas, I agree with Lightmane. If we run into the Wood Elves, let's all agree that we'll show respect while also trying to reason with them. And if they ask us to leave, let's ask them if we can first see the shrine and then we'll go. We just want to see it, as we've heard stories. Surely they can understand this. Heck, maybe they'll tell us what is true and what is false. Lightning. So are we in agreement then? We head out tomorrow to find the shrine, and if we run into wood elves, we'll try to reason with them, but we'll show respect and honor their wishes, since they are friends of Lord Doradin. I don't think we have any other option. Everyone agreed, except one. Shinfia. I'm not convinced we should try to find the shrine. Latia. Why not? Shinfia. Well, for the simple reason that they built it for Lord Doradin and his, and his party. Now we know that Doradin and his fellow adventurers go there like once a month or something, and we know others have traveled there, and some say they were attacked by wood elves, while others say the wood elves ordered them to leave their forest. No one has said the wood elves were nice and polite and understanding. All said they aren't friendly, and some say they're hostile. Is it worth risking relations with allies of Lord Doradin? Do we really want to risk ruining our reputations right at the start? I think it's better to stay on the roads and head to the moat house or the keep. But if you all want to try to find the shrine, I'll go. But we must not attack the Wood Elves. Unless they attack us, of course. If we all agree to that, then fine. Latia, I think we all agree to that. But I see what you're saying, Shin. I'm hoping that Lightmane and or myself will have a chance of talking with them. Shinfia, do you really think that because you're a type of elf that they'll not despise you as much as everyone else? Jack, they don't despise Lord Doradin or his party. Shinfia, Lord Doradin and his party saved their lives from hill giants, but I'm sh as I'm sure you remember from the stories that were told, the Wood Elves were not happy about Doradin building a castle in their forest and were quite angry when a village started forming. Latia, and now there's a wall around Duran, so they're good. Shinfia, they're good now, but only because we're all inside a walled village. As long as we don't travel through their forest, except on the main roads, they're good but they don't even like people traveling on the roads. It's really simple. Wood elves don't like non-wood elves. If they see us traveling in their forest, heading to their shrine, they're not going to be friendly. They're going to be angry. I, for one, am hoping that we don't run into them. Belfin, Phileas and I might be able to scout ahead to watch for them. Phileas, yes, good idea. Lightmane, I can move silently pretty well, too, but I have a much better chance of seeing them than you do. Belfin, you can't hide like we can, and you won't blend in very well, either. He turned to Phileas. Can you cast a spell to disguise us? Phileas, only on myself. Sorry. Belfin, fine. I'll just th I'll throw my cloak over my head and hide as best I can. I believe we can spot them before they spot us, if we do it this way. And if your elven eyesight sees them... Just give us a signal. No reason for you to be up ahead with us, right? Lightmane. So stay back with the party and whistle if I see them. Phileas. Whistle? Hmm. We need a signal that won't call attention. How about this? Phileas whistled like a bird three times. Lightmane. That works. Well, unless a bird in the area does the same, he said somewhat sarcastically. Latia. Okay, then. Tomorrow we buy supplies and head out in search of the sacred shrine to see what it does, if anything, and try to determine what rumors are true and what are false. I'm all on board with this. Everyone agree? The party spent the rest of the evening eating good food and singing and partying with all the patrons in the tavern. It was probably the most fun they'd had since they all arrived here within the last year. They were all looking forward to finally buying adventuring gear like backpacks and torches, iron spikes, and other gear that all adventuring parties needed, along with armor and weapons. 
Up until now, none of them really needed any of those supplies, and there was no point in owning armor while living in Duran. Only guards and adventurers who came through wore armor and carried larger weapons. Just about everyone owned a dagger or some other small weapon, or maybe a staff, but now they were looking forward to buying battle axes, long swords, flails, or maces. Prior to coming to Duran, they had each tried to form their own adventuring party with little or no luck, and each had tried to find a party to join, but all had failed. So they, so they each left their homes alone and traveled with a caravan and went wherever it took them in hopes that somehow, some way, they'd find or form an adventuring party. And when each of them came to the walled-in village of Duran that was inside a forest, they all chose to stay, feeling somehow drawn to its beauty. They all felt like they were supposed to stay here, at least for a while, and now they were all certain that fate had brought them all together. Afterwards, they each went back to the places where they worked and slept. They all worked either at a shop or a farm, mostly, while Tenneth worked at the temple. They were finally going to go adventuring. Dreams filled their head that night with monsters, treasures, and magic. The next morning, Latia. Okay, everyone, I recommend we all get at least one small and one large sack, a backpack, some iron spikes, 50 feet of rope, and maybe a large belt pouch, since I doubt our small belt pouch will be enough. I'm hoping that we're going to find lots of treasure, so let's make sure we have enough items to carry stuff in, in case we're so lucky. Tenneth, us humans are getting torches, and don't forget seven days of iron rations. I think everyone should buy some torches, though. Walking around in a dark cave without a light source doesn't seem wise to me. Latia, okay, you're probably right. Nightwind, iron rations, ugh. How about we adventure near a good tavern so we can have roast duck for dinner every night? Lightmane, sure, I'll put that on my to-do list. Adventure near tavern with roast duck on menu every night. Nightwind, did I just witness an elf being sarcastic? Lightmane, and now you know why we try to avoid hanging around dwarves. Nightwind, my god, I might just make a man out of this elf yet. Lightmane, imagine if I were to make you more like an elf. Nightwind, now you're scaring me. Latia, ha ha, very funny, boys, but let's get going. I want to go adventuring. Nightwind, we still need to buy armor and weapons. We're not going anywhere without those. Jack. Yes, and I'm buying some armor and weapons, too. I want a short sword, some leather armor, and a wooden shield. Nightwind. You're a wizard. What are you going to do? Throw them at people? Jack. Funny. No, I'm going to wear them and wield them. No way I'm going to get stuck in melee with some goblin and not have some protection. A long sword is a bit much, but I can handle a short sword just fine. And leather armor and a wooden shield is better than no armor. Nightwind, a wizard with a wooden shield. How does that work again? Jack, oh please, I can drop the shield to cast a spell any time. Wizards that go adventuring wearing a robe and holding a dagger makes my brain hurt just thinking about it. Nightwind, huh, I think you might be onto something. Jack, oh I know I am. I'm the weakest person here, and I'll be damned if I'm not going to do everything I can to protect myself. I can cast spells while wearing leather armor just fine. Lightning. I can cast spells while wearing bandit armor. Jack. Yeah, well, you're an elf. I'm not skilled like that. But I can still swing a short sword if I have to. I'm buying three daggers, too, so I have something to throw if I need to. Nightwind. Don't forget to buy a bow and send some arrows, too, he said sarcastically. Jack, well, at least we know who the comedian in the party is. But I might, but I just might learn how to use that weapon one day. Seems like a good idea. Nightwind, you, using a bow? Oh, I can't wait to see that. Jack just rolled his eyes. Lightning, unfortunately, I can't afford banded armor, so it'll have to be chainmail for now. Jack, wait, chainmail? For an elf? Isn't that elven chainmail? Lightmane, sadly, no. It's just chain mail made by a human, or a, by a human or a dwarf that is small enough that I can wear it. Elven chain mail is chain mail made by an elf for an elf. 
Good luck finding that anywhere but up north in the Elven Kingdom. We probably have a better chance of finding magical armor than Elven chainmail. Jack. I see. Well, thank you for explaining that to me. I never quite understood it. Still not sure I do, but I digress. Lightmane just smiled. With all their supplies purchased, the group was finally ready to go adventuring. Jack. Is everyone done buying gear? Are we all ready to head out? Latia. Yes, finally. Latia was starting to feel nervous, but she was sure that was a good thing. The eight adventurers headed to the south exit of Duran and headed out into the forest. After buying all the necessary supplies for adventuring, there was very little money left, which didn't make anyone feel very comfortable. But they were certain that lots of treasure was in their future. All they had to do now was find some. Latia. Wait, is it to the southeast or southwest? Lightmane. Southeast. Latia. Are you sure? Lightmane. Yes, dear. I'm sure. Latia. Dear? Lightmane smiled. Latia just shook her head in dismay, but also smiled. Shinfia. So how exactly do we find it? Just walk southeast? Belfin. Dorden has been going there for years. Pretty sure there's a trail now. In no time at all, a clear trail came into view. Shinfia, well, this will make it a lot easier. So all we have to do is walk down this trail? What is it, like three miles from here? Belfin, something like that. Phil and I will scout ahead, maybe 30 feet or so. Just make sure you keep us in your line of sight. Latia, is this really happening? This is really happening, right? We're actually going adventuring, right? Nightwind, you darn right we are. I'm so done with working in a shop all day long. Now we just need to get some money so we can buy some good food. Lightmane. Is the thought of eating iron rations for seven days making your stomach hurt? Nightwind. Oh, you have no idea. But if you think it's an issue for me, wait until the hobbit starts complaining. You know what they say about hobbits. Lightmane. No, what? Nightwind. If they're not working or sleeping, it's because they're eating. Jack. Uh Uh-oh. Well, that's not good. Hope we can keep you and the Hobbit happy. I, for one, think iron rations are just fine. But I sure don't like being almost broke. Everyone agreed. The feeling was mutual. The trail was clear and easy to traverse. The weather was nice. A cool breeze was in the air, and it felt good on their skin as they walked down the trail. Everything just felt right. They all kept looking at each other and smiling as they walked, happy to be an official party now, happy to be together on their own, adventuring. Sheila. So it begins. Bale, looking at Sheila, somewhat confused. This is the group that you're interested in? Sheila. One of, yes. Bale. Why? Sheila. Reasons, my floppy-eared friend. Reasons. Bale. Your floppy-eared friend also has reasons. Reasons for concern. Sheila. You really worry too much. You know that. Bale. I'll try to worry less. Sheila. Good boy, she said with a smile. Bale. Can you just stop now? Sheila just smiled a big smile, slowly put her hand on his head, and started petting him. Bale just sighed. 